Well, the major hit was actually. Hold on, Betsy's screwing up here. It's Biden. He wants it. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of The Giza Show. I'm your host, Len Marino Sr. Today, we have for the first time interviews with three people at the same location. These people are unique in their talents and the involvement of some who changed in mid-career. I'm going to lead off talking to the major domo of this trio, Kenny Passarelli. Well, there he is, star of Space Screen and Radio. Well, look at that outfit. Great. Let's start with a bio from you from birth to right now. Well, I was immaculately conceived and... <laughs> you know what? I grew up in Denver. I was headed towards a classical career as a, a, a symphonic trumpet player. I was very fortunate to have found uh, rock and roll and the trumpet at that point in 1967 wasn't going to fit. I had some friends in high school who uh, talked their parents into spending money and buying electric guitars because because the Beatles had arrived and the British invasion. and and the Beach Boys, all this stuff was going on. Our generation was speaking to, to the world. And uh, there was a drum set and there were some guitars and nobody was playing the bass. It was like, it wasn't an in instrument back then. It is now. I started playing those first four strings of the guitar and taught myself how to play the bass because the bass is the first four strings of the lower strings of, of the guitar. E-A-D-G. And so I listened to records. I was, uh, I taught myself how to play. Trumpet is this. I had to teach my left, I taught my left hand to play the notes, but I had all of this in my head of years and years of playing scales and, and the trumpet from the time I was seven until I was 16. I had a real formal education. Once I got a bass, I spent a lot of time practicing and uh, the little bands I was in started uh, performing around Denver, but say from 65, 66, 67. Those were, those were the early years of me playing the bass guitar. And I loved it, I did, right away. I saw the function of what the instrument was, I, I felt at that point, was supposed to do. And I, it, it was the right instrument for me. In 1971, uh, I met a guy who had already had a hit single by the name of Joe Walsh. He was somewhat famous at that time. And uh, he'd left his band, the James Gang, and had moved to Nederland, Colorado with his wife and baby. The um, introduction to Joe Walsh was really the beginning of my career. I'd been working with another gentleman by the name of Stephen Stills, who uh, I was seeing socially, really. He was living in Boulder at the time and he'd had great success with Crosby, Stills and Nash. The first time I really felt that I was maybe had a career with this was at Stephen Stills. It was uh, February of 1969. I knock on the door and the door opens and there's Stephen Stills. So he played me the Crosby, Stills and Nash record and I heard it in February of 1969 that was released in August and it became, you know, they became the American Beatles. What was the song, what was the major song on that one? Sweet Judy Blue Eyes. Oh, Joe calls me a year later and says, a guy by the name Elton John wants to hire you, I recommended you. So the next thing I knew I was on a plane to Paris and I worked with Elton John for two years. I did 83 concerts with Elton. My experience with Elton was I, I always say it was the height of my career in many ways. He was a super talented guy. He was very consistent. And then we ended up at Madison Square Gardens in August of 1976. We did seven sold out dates. We had the James Cleveland Choir behind us for the encores. It was quite a spectacular experience for me. We're talking about a real disciplined three hour concert and a lot of pressure. You know, Selton's a serious artist, and what we were doing 
you know, on her own maybe was a little bit different than what Elva was doing. But uh, the whole focus was to do a great performance. My first concert with Elton was at Wembley Stadium for 100,000 people. We played an album nobody even knew, Captain Fantastic. Oh my God. And, and here you are at the cusp of like, it's a real cultural revolution. Absolutely, and, and the Elton John is even one step higher because you had a gay man who was not allowed to expose the fact you know, to tell the world that he was a homosexual. So he was, uh, it was it was a secret. If you looked out in the crowd, Glenn, in 1975, 55,000 people, I'd say a majority of, of the kids that were out there were teenage girls. They loved that one. And he signed his deal in 70, 71. So by 76, I mean, he was the biggest star in the world. So the last thing the company wanted to do was to reveal this. And it was very hard on him. Our records came in to Billboard charts number one. Millions of records sold. We're playing in front of thousands of people every night. So the pressure was on. This guy is the biggest star in the world. He wanted to tell the world he was, this is who I am. And he did a Rolling Stone interview when he said he was bisexual, which, you know, he was just easing into it. It wasn't really true. So uh, after Elton John, it was Hollow Notes, and after Hollow Notes, I decided to take some time off and I traveled to different places. I was in Europe and I was in South America, really working on my songwriting. I wanted to be a songwriter like Johnny Mercer or Gershwin. I wasn't very good at writing lyrics. I could come up with some lines, maybe a title, and a few ideas, but uh, my goal was to to really write great songs, a real marriage of, of melody and, and lyric and understanding what, the, what, what real songs were about. And uh, it took me to uh, meeting uh, my girlfriend, my partner, my collaborator, Amy Loper, before I really resolved all this, this songwriting stuff and really came to the point where I felt I, I could really express myself, the melodies, could, could speak for the first time. Suns will burn, moons will rise. Again, the dance is yours. Forever is Now is our crazy and improbable story of two people who met when they were eligible for Social Security and started writing songs together a few years later. What? Now healthy food must get me through. The first hit song that I was a part of was Rocky Mountain Way in 1970-72. And when we played it live, well, Joe Walsh was at Kent State. He attended Kent State and he was there when the shooting happened. He was there protesting too. So he was affected by that. And when we did Rocky Mountain Way, the lyrics say things like, you know, bases are loaded and Casey's at bat. Well, when we played this live in 72, we said bases are loaded and Nixon's at bat. Time to change the batter. So we were out there saying, how the people are, you know, enough change, stop the war. Music is air and vibration, okay? So how does it come about? Where do you hear the melodies? The reason why music is so powerful is because it is like, and I'll, I'm quoting Beethoven, but it's a direct link to the creator, I believe. And I think that's why it can make you sad, it can make you happy, it can make you dance, it can make you cry, it can make you do all these different things. And I'm just grateful to, to have been able to do this. I'm, I'll be 72 in, in October and I've done this since I was seven. I've seen how music from the time I was a child, there was a reaction, you know. So I learned early that if you can move people through music, it's the, the greatest satisfaction I've ever had. I think like anything else, if you work really hard, then people are going to notice. And uh, I was diligent. Well, it played an important part of my life. I, I sang 
with a group called the Hepscats, three guys and a gal, and we played clubs around uh, Boston, and we were doing bar mitzvahs and weddings and, and stuff like that. It was a lot of fun. It really was. And uh, I had a friend, his name was Nicky Capizzuto. He was a trumpet player. And he had a, a raspy voice. He could imitate Louis Armstrong. That's, I mean, he really could imitate him. And uh, he was in the Navy band. He went uh, by motorcycle out to the West Coast to try out with Stan Kenton. And, uh, <laughs> well, he didn't latch on with Stan Kenton. He was only 17 at the time. I met Nikki one time on a weekend. We both had off in Boston. And we took a bus to Providence, Rhode Island, and Stan Kenton was playing there. So we went up and we're in uniform and we're standing. We wiggled our way up to the front of the crowd, right in front of the bandstand. Nikki calls out in the break, Stan, Stan. And Stan turns around and says, Jesus Christ, not you again. <laughs> and he wanted to play with the band. Nicky said, I, I got my mouthpiece. He says, yeah, am I going to let the lead trumpet of Buddy Childers step aside and have you sit in? But you know what? He says, ladies and gentlemen, I have a special guest. He's a young man who has haunted me for years. That's exact. <laughs> that was his exact words. He, and he said, he told how he went out there and everything. And so Stan turned around and he said, he's in the service now. And Buddy Childers, the lead trumpet, is going to step aside and Nikki's going to come up here and play artistry and rhythm. And that was it. Nikki nearly fainted in front of me, but it was it. And it was one of the most exciting things for me, as well as Nikki. So that was it. Yeah, and let's, oh, that's the microphone, right? Um, there was an arm in the way. Oh, no, that's and just... It's not in the way anymore. <laughs> Len, I would like to introduce my partner, my, co my, my girl. Amy Loper to the Geezer Show. Amy? Hi, Len. How are you doing? Hi. Let's talk about some of your background before you started playing guitar and singing. You're a little girl growing up, parents, so forth. There's your, one of your parents there. Nice to be here. I grew up in Denver like Kenny, and uh, I went to Oregon uh, to Lewis and Clark for college because I wanted to be away from my home. like every 18 year old uh, and I came back here went to DU Law School and really there's not much to tell about my life because then I practiced law for the next 40 years and I was a what? trial lawyer uh, primarily a divorce lawyer for most of my career but uh, early on I was also a commercial trial lawyer and I I liked trying cases in the courtroom's a rush it's a big rush oh. I happened to hear a cassette when we first got together in 2015, I said, what's this cassette? And she was a bit shy about it. And I played the cassette and it was, she was playing a 12 string guitar. She was going to uh, Lewis and Clark. And I, wow. I, I heard it. I said, you could have paid your way through school just playing clubs. That's how good it was. Once I saw that, it just kind of a, somewhat of a light came on. And, and I always remember the first time I heard her sing, and she's very shy about her voice. We've come a long way to where we are now, but it's it's something that she was doing many, many years ago. And after practicing law, and uh, we got together, and here we are making music, but it's it's something that well, I'll let her carry on with, with, with her influences, which have, have to do with the way she grew up, right? listening to folk music. Folk music, classical music. Thing, but my biggest influences are Ian Anderson and Frank Zappa 
as lyricists. And let me think, there may be one other who's really great. I mean, uh, we're not talking about Bob Dylan because he's in, a, of course, a class of his own. It's the lyrics that kind of grab me about the music. And Kenny's music is so evocative. It's uh, the lyrics seem to be embedded in that music. And uh, it's, it's, it's as though they were waiting for me to come and liberate them, but they're there because the music is just, Kenny's music is incredible, it's absolutely incredible. And it lends itself to, to lyrics. So we've had a, a surprisingly easy time falling into um, writing music and we've, we've got quite a bit of material. We have 50 copywritten songs. And, and so the COVID was, 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 was very good was to very us. Very good to us. We <laughs> we just dug in and continued to write songs and shape things up, come up with ideas. That's choice. There's fate. Eternity. in the woods where we once stood with our children hard easy monies so easy they say there's good reason to leave I think I'll stay makes his home on the sidewalk in another life it could be me or you The frame is old, the canvas covered Warmth and light revealing Love transforms And then, uh, and moving from Vail to, to uh, Balfour gave us an opportunity. Number one, that's how we met you and started playing the, the ukulele. And we started coming over there and playing the, that, in that beautiful room, the Moffat room. This is Ann Loper. This is Amy's mother. And, um, and through Ann Loper is the reason why we, we've met Len at Belfort. One and only rebel child from a family meek and You guys should be playing in clubs around town. <laughs> well, if you were our agent, we would. We, we, need, a, we need a good agent, Len. Yep. Hi, Ann. I, I got loads of questions for you. So you were born here in Denver? No, I was born uh, actually in Boise, Idaho. And uh -huh. when I was um, about 14, my parents uh, took me up to a little ski area named Bogus Basin. There were about six of us and we had ski lessons from Lee Backus and he was so good to our little group. He encouraged us and made a little team and the uh, newspaper in Boise sponsored us. So we got to travel when I was in high school to various cities uh, and, and towns and compete. So when I was ready to go to college, I decided to go to Boulder because I knew that skiing in Colorado would be good. And I got on the ski team there and, and uh, raced there for three years. So uh, skiing has been very good to me. That was my one of my two paying careers. <laughs> then, of course, all my life, I've always sung, but the other paying career was uh, ceramics, which I got into in 1973 and spent 40 years making pots and selling pots. Now the singing has never really brought any money, but it has been a wonderful part of my life. Hey, here's one of her pots. Oh, that's gorgeous. I, uh, Great. The last time I skied was uh, about a year and a half ago, just before. What? 
the pandemic kicked in. Wow. Wow. I... It has been such fun. Well, I always love to sing. And when I met my husband, he wasn't a great skier, but he had a really nice voice and he loved folk songs, folk music. Probably my favorite singer at that time was Joan Baez. I just, we both just thought she walked on water. Oh God, that's great. So we both uh, took up the guitar and played together and we sang to the kids, uh, the three kids. And if we would drive up skiing and we would sing all the way up and all the way back. So it was a big part of our family life. Now, are your other kids uh, living near here too? Um, my son, Steve, lives in Golden and uh, he plays the guitar very, very well. And the third son went to uh, the University of, of Bordeaux in France for uh. his junior year in college out of California. Mm. And he met a French girl and they fell in love. So he's been in Paris since 1980. Wow. But he's very musical too. He played, uh, I think he played the clarinet and he plays the guitar and he can play the piano. So it's it's a big family thing, music. Yeah. I find you so inspiring, Anne, because you're kind of like a shiny example of what I hope to be. Somebody who is living life to the fullest at any point. And, and, and so I'm so inspired by your positivity and kind of, you know, like my dad, I find it really inspiring. What's your secret and what advice would you give to, you know, people who are younger than you, who are, you know, well, moving in that direction? I'm very lucky. I have a wonderful family. I had a wonderful husband and I like people. And teaching skiing was a lot of fun because I was associating with people all the time and music is the same. So I, I guess uh, it's just hard to sit still and do nothing. I wish uh, I were better at it, but uh, I do like socialization. I think people are wonderful. And that's most of the things I, I do involve people. I know the chords. Okay. <laughs> All right. Let's give it a shot. It's B. Yes. In the in the chorus, there's that B minor. So it goes. Okay. Here we go. I know that you tried to teach me to play the ukulele. You move these two fingers, the twos and threes, over this way, and the fourth is free, you're not using the fourth. So two okay. goes high, three goes there. Oh, great, 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 great. This is terrific. I'm gonna keep trying. All I need is for this left hand to cooperate. As we talked about getting some sort of a, a percussion instrument uh, that you could play along with uh, little brushes. I used to fake it on the drums, I always, used to depend upon the wire brushes because when it came to long paradiddle and drum solos, I'd flip all over the place. I'd drop my drumsticks. So I played it safe and used wire brushes. I think Anne really represents this, and I think you do too, about reinventing yourself and finding more things to be passionate about and learning a new instrument and you continuing to to want to uh, do your show and interview people. To me, that's the most inspiring thing. And, and it's it's inspired me. So uh, I, I, I applaud both of you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But I love it. I, I, I just like people and I love the opportunity to explore people's backgrounds. It's amazing where you you see somebody and you just start chatting with them and then you find out what a fantastic life they've had. That's important. So true. Kenny and I were joking that it was like, it's kind of like a commercial. 
Talk to a geezer near you, Len. <laughs> Talk to a geezer near you. <laughs> yeah. I talked to a lot of them. Do you think you could be a gizette? Yeah. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you are a gizette. Well, I love getting to know you. I am so grateful that you gave us your time today. And it's been our pleasure. Absolutely. And what a beautiful gift you've all been to my dad to have people like you who are Well, he's hanging. done the same for us. We I so know. enjoy it. Absolutely. Absolutely. He's just a, a bright, shining light. Dad, you hear that? You're a bright, shining light. Yeah. Gee. Don't want us. Change the Watch out. I got to take my hat off. My head is expanding. <laughs> Remember, there's two things in life. If you can't take part in a sport, be one anyway. And the other one is swing easy. Swing easy. We have to write a song, Sweeney. Oh, I love that. We will write a song for you called Swing Easy. Okay, you know something? It's on my gravestone. <laughs> We're not Let's see. The Geezer Show is going to be the longest running show. <laughs> the longest running show ever. Because, yes, Dad, tell them when you're going to stop doing the Geezer Show. Oh, I'm going to stop when they put me into a casket. There we go. <laughs> All right. I see. And well, I may have repeat shows showing over the casket. We'll see you soon, Len. I'll Take see. care. I'll see hey. you at four o'clock. Oh yeah, we're going to happy hour. Happy hour. It's Wednesday. Yay!